Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Gopi Janavalabha Girivara Dari Yashoranandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yashoranandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yamuna Tiravanachari Yamuna Tiravanachari Radha Madhava Kunja Bihadi Gopi Jana Vallabha Giri Varadadi Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Gopi Jana Vallabha Giri Varatari Yasharanandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yashoranandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yamuna Tiravana Chari Yamuna Tiravana Chari Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Gopi Jana Vallabha Giri Varadari Gopi Jana Vallabha Giri Varadari Jai Amda Shupad Paramahamsa Pali Raja Bacharya Shada Shada Shri Shumada Zavan Grace Esi Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Jai Om Vishnu Pad Parmaham Supari Vajra Kacharya Ashto Tadashita Shri Shimada Zavangre Shila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Prabhupada Ki Jai Ananta Koti Vaishnava Rinda Ki Jai Namacharya Srila Haridas Thakur Ki Jai Prem Sikaho Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhupada Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vas Adi Gauda Bhakti Vrinda Ki Jai Shri Shri Radha Krishna Gop Gopina Shama Kun Radha Kun Giri Gopidan Ki Jai Vrindavan Dham Ki Jai Navadip Dham Ki Jai Ganga Yamuna Mai Ki Jai Tosi Maharani Ki Jai Bhakti Devi Ki Jai Samaveta Bhakti Vrinda Ki Jai All glories to the Samuel Devotees All glories to the Samuel Devotees All glories to the Samuel Devotees All glories to Shri Guru and Shri Gauranga Can you bring the book, Dimitri? I don't know if you heard me. Or it looks like Tyler's. Okay. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Fifth Canto, The Creative Impetus, Chapter 18, The Residents of Jambu Dweep Offer Prayers, Text 21. Ya Tasya Te Pada Sororuhara Nam 
Nikamayet Sakila Kama Vampata Tad Eva Rasipsitam Ipsito Chito Yad Bhagna Yachna Bhagavan Pratapjate Yatasjate Parasaroru Harhanam Nikama Yatsaki the Kama Lumpata Tareva Sip Sitam Ipsitor Chito Yet Bagna Yachna Bagavan Prapat Yate Yatasyate Padasaro Ruharhanam Nikama Yatsakila Kama Lampata Tareva Rasip Sitam Ipsitor Chito Yad Bhagna Yachna Bhagavan Prapat Yate Yatas Yate Padasaro Ruharhanam Nikama Yatsakila Kama Lamputa Tareva rasipsitam ipsitor chuto. Yagbagna yachna bhagavan prapatyate. Okay, word by word. Ya, a woman who, tasya, of him, te, of you, paras soro ruha, of the lotus feet, arhanam, the worship, nikamayet, fully desires. Sa, such a woman, Akila Kamalampata, although maintaining all kinds of material desire, Tat, that, Eva, only, Rasi, your word, Ipsitam, some other desired benediction, Ipsitaha, being looked to for, Architaha, Worshipped, yet from which bhagna yachna, one who desires objects other than your lotus feet, and who thus becomes broken. Bhagavan, O oh my Lord, Prata Prata Yate is pained. 
Translation and commentary by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. My dear Lord, you automatically fulfill all the desires of a woman who worships your lotus feet in pure love. However, if a woman worships your lotus feet for a particular purpose, you also quickly fulfill her desires. But in the end, she becomes brokenhearted and laments. Therefore, one need not worship your lotus feet for some material benefit. Purport. Srila Rupa Goswami describes pure devotional service as Anyabila Shita Shunyam Jnana Karmada An Avritam. One should not worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead to fulfill some material desire for success in fruit of activities or mental speculation. To serve the lotus feet of the Lord means to serve Him exactly as He desires. The neophyte devotees therefore ordered to worship the Lord strictly according to the regulative principles given by the spiritual master and the shastras. By executing d devotional service in that way, excuse me, he gradually becomes attached to Krishna. And when his original dormant love for the Lord becomes manifest, he spontaneously serves the Lord without any motive. <clears throat> this condition is the perfect stage of one's relationship with the Lord. The Lord then looks after the comfort and security of his devotee without being asked. Krishna promises in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9, text 22, Ananyash chintayanto mam ye jana paryupasate tesham nityabhyuktanam yogachemam vihamiyaham. The Supreme Lord personally takes care of anyone who completely engages in his devotional service. Whatever he has, the Lord protects, and whatever he needs, the Lord supplies. Therefore, why should one bother the Lord for something material? Such prayers are unnecessary. Sri the Vishnath Chakravati Thakur explains that even if a devotee wishes the Lord to fulfill a particular desire, the devotee should not be considered a Sakama Bhakta, a devotee with some motive. In the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 7, text 16, Krishna says, Chatur Vidha Bhajante Mam Jana Sukriti Arjuna Arto Jigyasur Artarti Jnani Cha Bharatarshaba. O best among the Bharats, Arjuna, four kinds of pious men render devotional service unto me the distressed, the desire of wealth inquisitive, and he who is searching for knowledge of the Absolute. The Arta and the Artarti, who approach the Supreme Personality of Godhead for relief from misery or for some money, are not Sakama Bhaktas, although they appear to be. Being neophyte devotees, they are simply ignorant. Later in Bhagavad Gita, the Lord says, Udara Sarva Eve Te, they are all magnanimous, Udaraha. Although in the beginning a devotee may harbor some desire, in due course of time it will vanish. Therefore the Srimad Bhagavatam enjoins a kama savakama va mokshakama dadadi tivrena bhakti yogena yajete purusham param. A person who has broader intelligence, whether he is full of all material desire, is free from material desire, or has desire for liberation, must by all means worship the Supreme Whole, the Personality of Godhead. 2.3.10 Bhagavatam. Even if one wants something, mater something material, he should pray to no one but the Lord to fulfill his desire. If one approaches a demigod for the fulfillment of his desires, he is considered nashtabuddhi, bereft of all good sense. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 7, text 20, Kamas tastar hitigyana prapadyante in the devata, tam tam niyamam astaya prakatya niyatasvaya. Those whose minds are distorted by material desires surrender to demigods and follow the particular rules and regulations of worship according to their own natures. Natures. <clears throat> Lakshmi Devi advises all devotees who approach the Lord with material desires 
that according to her practical experience, the Lord is accommodative, and thus there is no need to ask him for anything material. She says that everyone should simply serve the Lord without any motive. Since the Supreme Personality of God is sitting in everyone's heart, he knows everyone's thoughts, and in due course of time he will fulfill all desires. Therefore, let us completely depend on the service of the Lord without bothering him with our own with our material requests. Om Jnana Timirandasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chukshulan Militam Bhena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Bukam Karitvacha Bukam Karitvacha Lam Pangam Langai Te Gidim Yakripatamaham Vande Shri Guru Ndini Tarinam Vancha Kapadri Bhishcha Kripasindu Bhavacha Patitanam Pavani Bhil Vaishnavi Bhil Manamaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Pravanitananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasudhi Gaura Bhakti Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So I think our Vijay Prabhu was uh, scheduled to give class today, but he's <coughs> in Los Angeles taking care of his teeth. <laughs> no um, offense towards him, uh, but we could learn from him and others that if you don't take care of him now, you have to take care of him later. <laughs> Um, so it's important to do that because anyways, anybody who has to go through all that, they know it's just, we actually have two devotees going through that and it's a lot of money, um, that, that generally devotees don't have. And even if devotees do have, they don't want to spend that much money on them. It's like thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. So it's a lot of money and it's a lot of time. An inconvenience. Um, so, better just take the sim simple precautions uh, that are necessary to avoid that. Very simple, you know, just flossing every day, brushing teeth twice a day, going to the dentist, right? At least once a year, if not twice. Or else, <laughs> got to fork over the fork over the Lakshmi later. And a lot of suffering also. Um, like Sri the Prabhupada said about our general health, he said, better take care of your health because time passes and even though you may want to preach, you won't be able to as much as you want or maybe not even at all. Um so better take care of health. Just like many devotees, their travel these days are restricted. Not because it necessarily has to be, or actually it has to be, because of their health. If they if they travel, <laughs> um, their the <laughs> their bodies will just stop working, literally drop. Um, so of course, a lot of devotees sacrifice their health in the early days of ISKCON for Sri the Prabhupada's service, that's one thing. But um, as far as possible, we should take care because it's like a marathon, running a marathon, you want to be strong the whole way. <laughs> I don't want to start falling, uh, collapsing towards the middle of the race, what to speak of the end, or what to, yeah, whatever. You don't want to collapse early, so. It's important to take care. And it's actually very painful. I mean, if you have a desire to preach and you and you just physically like you know, you need to, you can't drag your body around to do that. It's it's actually a suffering state. So. Uh, so taking care of health is not Maya. Um So here in this particular verse in purport it's mentioning anya bilashita shunyam jnana karmani avrtam that devotional service, specifically pure devotional service, is devoid 
of other desires. Desires for fruit of activity in this material world, um, whatever, speculative knowledge, um, etc. Adi means etc. So in other words, there's many desires one could have in this world. So devotional service means to become free. Pure devotional service means to become free from all those desires. Um, and part of becoming free of all those material desires means to take complete shelter in Krishna, to trust Krishna, not that if we fall, we're having second guess guesses if Krishna's going to be there to catch us. Um, not that we are doubting uh, Krishna's instructions. We don't hesitate to follow them. Right? Like in the Bhagavad Gita at the end, Sarvadamam Pratyajam Mame Kam Shuranam Vajam. He says, I shall protect you. Do not fear. Also, do not hesitate. He's saying, don't hesitate. Just move forward. Proceed. Um, and if we hesitate to follow the instructions of Krishna, we may have to see hell. <laughs> um, now, that doesn't mean eternal hell. I'm not, we're not, we're not going to have a Christian sermon here. Uh, what do you call a fanatical or what is that? What's the word called? Another fire word, and fire and brimstone. But there's another word that's attached to Christians who are, um, yeah, fundamental Christian sermon here. But if we hesitate to follow Christian instruction, we may have to see hell. We may not have to go to hell, but we may have to see hell. Just like Yudhishthira Maharaj. Yudhishthira Maharaj was the on, was an honest devotee. It says he never told a lie, and as Vijay Prabhu likes to say, <laughs> um, tells you something about everybody else. <laughs> he was famous for never telling a lie, right? So Yudhishthira Maharaj, um, he at on the battlefield of Kukchetra, they wanted to. Anyways, Krishna said to uh, that he wanted him to tell a lie. And what is that lie? Ashwatthama's dead, right? Because this would help in the war, in the battle, help the Pandavas to win. But Yudhishthira Maharaj, of course, he's a pure devotee and a great devotee, but somehow or other he hesitated. And he said after that, his the wheels of his chariot that would always float above the ground, hit, hit the ground. Not because he lied, because ultimately he did say Ashwatthama, but then there's a, the elephant, right, he's dead. But not because he lied did the, did the wheels hit the ground, but because he hesitated to follow Krishna's instructions. It's actually said he, 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 he actually saw hell also. Um, so if we hesitate to follow Krishna's instructions or take shelter of Krishna we may have to see hell it means in our dreams you could say bad dreams nightmares um, maybe even in our daydreams right? we, we may have to expel, experience some type of hellish consciousness because we are hesitating to follow Krishna's instructions um, and this, you could say, punishment is um, we, we're 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 self-inflicting. We're we're we're, <laughs> we're inflicting we're, we're we're inflicting pain on ourselves. Um, it's a weird thing that a conditioned soul does: inflict pain on themselves. Uh, in other words, we don't have to suffer, we don't have to see hell, we don't have to see these hellish states, but somehow or other, um, we, we uh, choose to. When did Yudhishthira see hell? 
You're going to have to read the whole... Uh, how many verses are in Mahabharata? How many verses? 800,000 or something like that. 100,000. You're going to have to read the whole 100,000 verses of Mahabharata to say that. <laughs> I think it was later on, yeah. Um, so, so this this pain that we experience, that we may experience, um, we should see that as like an impetus for for change. That's what an intelligent person does. An intelligent person doesn't say, "Oh, I'm suffering like a dog." All right, I guess that's life. Let me just suffer like an animal, right? <laughs> Let me just be depressed. Let me just remain in darkness, right? But a fortunate person, intelligent person, well, I'm suffering. Let me adjust myself. Let me, right? If you're freezing to death by staying in your dark room with, without any, um, without any uh, heating system, um, but the sun is shining outside. Interesting enough, that could happen. I don't know about freezing to death, but you're suffering due to cold. Go outside, resituate yourself, put yourself in the sun, right? Do something. So that's what Krishna wants us to do, to, to take some initiative, um, take some responsibility on, uh, for our situation. We cooked the soup, right? We cooked our soup. Now we have to finish it. <laughs> um, as some saying goes from someone, I'm not sure. Maybe we could do some investigation. So uh, so to take shelter of Krishna, that's we have to constantly try to do that. Um, try and try and try. And gradually... Uh, we will become free from our material desires. Uh, and as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, that we don't, ha we do not have to ask Krishna for this or that for so many things, for our material comfort or for our material security, whatever. Um, we don't have to ask Krishna. Uh, for the things we need. He provides them without asking. Um, just like a good father, he will know what the son needs. It's not that the son is in a subordinate position than the father, right? Healthy relationship, healthy society. The father, caring father, knows what the son needs and he provides it. It's not that the son's always asking, oh, dad, you know, I need this, I need that. I mean... <laughs> But he just, he sees, he's observing, okay, what does my son need? Oh, it looks like his sweater's worn out. Okay, let me get let me get him another sweater, right? Or we have our paw on here. He understands what Gurungi needs. She doesn't have to ask, right? You say, okay, she needs this, she needs that, right? A good parent knows. So similarly, Krishna knows what we need. So we don't have to be going to him and saying, oh, please give me this, please give me that. But this or that, if we need it, will come by his um, arrangement. So then Chatur Vidha Bhajante Mam, there's the four types of people who come to Krishna, those who are suffering after wealth, who are inquisitive, and who are searching for knowledge of the Absolute. So these personalities, they're pious, um, but they still have desires. It means they're not, it's not pure. They're not just going to Krishna. It's not that, the pure devotees don't serve Krishna because it makes them peaceful. Okay, great, now I'm going to be peaceful or I'm going to get some benefit for myself. But the pure devotees serve Krishna just to please Krishna. So that's the difference between the Chatur Vidha Bhajanti Mam and the pure devotees. Pure devotees just are engaged in pure, loving, devotional service. Um, and of course, we shouldn't go to the demigods uh, 
for that, for what we need. Of course, those growing up in, from Western background, usually don't have that problem. But you'd be surprised. <laughs> um, it's amazing how the mind and the intelligence and the false ego and everything else could latch on to everything else besides Krishna, including demigods and whatever else. But Krishna is the main uh, man, not man, but he's the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, um, I mean, of course, the gopis prayed to, to Katyayani, right? But what were they praying for to have Krishna as a husband? Um, sometimes it's said that devotees may pray to Ganesh to, for the removal of obstacles. But one thing to note is that, I mean, an interesting thing to note, I mean, not, it is mentioned that devotees can pray to Ganesh, but one thing to note is that Ganesha's power, it states in the Sri Brahma Samhita, is coming from Lord Nrsinghadev. The lotus feet of Lord Nrsinghadev. Um, but anyways, of course, the demigod's power have to, become, have to be coming from somewhere, right? They're not independent. So devotees may worship Ganesh for removal of obstacles. Nrsinghadev, of course, is Krishna. Um, but they have to be careful <laughs> they have to be careful that they don't become um, uh, Ganesh conscious means they, they, they forget about Krishna and they become Ganesh conscious which for some people would say oh well that's not a problem at all right I'm not going to become Ganesh conscious well it may be a problem for someone else. Um, they may just focus all their attention on Ganesh and may forget about Krishna to, to, to a degree, which it's not good to forget about Krishna to any degree. Um, so the demigods or whatever, they may pray to other demigods. There may be some attraction to the demigods, even from those who are from Western backgrounds, right? Mystical, amazing demigods, right? Uh, but anything material, bank balance, health, um, possessions, or more subtle, some adoration or some respect from others, we don't want to depend on any of this. We don't want to take shelter of any of this. Uh, because to be a anya uh, bilashita shunyam devotee, to be a pure devotee, means we don't take shelter of any of this. We may have all these things. We may have <laughs> some bank balance. We may have some uh, possessions, some health, some adoration, some respect. We may pray to Katyayani to make Krishna her husband, <laughs> whatever. But we may do so many things, but ultimately we know, or a pure devotee knows, that their main focus is Krishna. Uh, Radha Krishna, Radha Girdari. So lastly, Lakshmi Devi is saying, no need to approach Krishna for anything material. Um, he's in everybody's heart, and knows everybody's thoughts, and in due course of time he, he will fulfill all desires. So we have to be also careful what desires we're cultivating. Um, it says the holy name of Krishna is Chintamani means wish-fulfilling gem, what you want, uh, what you want in life, uh, yeah, you could get from Krishna. And as Rajendra Prabhu would mention often, I'm remembering now, 
he would say, if you want a bunch of material things from Krishna, Krishna could give that easily. He could give you know, some social position of respect. He could give some type of material facilities very easily. And we could be going on for years like that, decades, lifetimes. But pure devotional service, he doesn't give so easily. <laughs> but that's what we should really be striving for. Um, we should be asking for that. And then Prabhupada says, Therefore, let us completely depend on the service of the Lord without bothering him with our material requests. So no need to bother Krishna with material requests. Just like we're calling out to Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, right? We're calling out every day. So naturally, right, when you're calling somebody's name, they say, okay, what do you want? <laughs> so again, I've mentioned this before, but we may not verbally express what we want, although that's maybe... Anyways, we may not verbally express what we want, but... Desires are a subtle form of, of prayer. It means uh, desire, most of desires, I mean, most of prayers um, include asking for something, either spiritual or material. So we're chanting Hare Krishna, and Krishna's saying, okay, what do you want? So we have to be careful what we want. And uh, we should try to cultivate the desire for pure devotional service, the desire to be a a pure devotee, surrender to Krishna with no other desires. So, all right, does anybody have any uh, questions? Yes, Dimitri? Yes, Bhagavan, thank you for class. Uh, question is, how do you approach Krishna with uh, desire for pure devotional service? Okay. Well, the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu is there, the Nectar Devotion. It describes what the pure devotional service entails, what it means to be a pure devotee. So we should hear and read and study Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu and other such books. And then by hearing and reading and studying and discussing, we will develop a desire to to uh, reach that stage. Without reading, hearing, and discussing, we will just fall, you could say, the, what is it, the human beings have the tendency to, what, fall to the lowest common denominator, is that what it is? In other words, we won't have a very glorious life. That's why so much emphasis is given in hearing and discussing and reading because that hearing and discussing and reading will actually help us cultivate desire to achieve that. If we're just listening to our mind and our senses, uh, we'll never really be able to cultivate the, that desire. So therefore we have to open our ears and our minds to the messages of Krishna and we'll develop that desire. So then once we start developing that desire, even if it's a small desire, we could go to Krishna and say, please engage me in your devotional service. Please engage me in your pure devotional service. Um, please let me wake in pure love for you. Right? We could go and we could pray for that. Please cleanse my heart from all unwanted things. And there's many prayers like that prayer we just read recently to Lord Nishinga Dev, Om Namo Bhagavate, Nada Singhaya, Namaste, just say, just say, Avir, Avir, Bhagavate, Raja Dangsha Kamashayan, Randi, Randi, Tamagasagas, Om Swaha. This verse is saying anyone who wants to be free from material desires could pray to Nishinga Dev like Prahlad Maharaj prayed. So we can learn some verses. I uh Twai Nanda Vishaya, right or not Vishya. Anyways. <laughs> Vishya senses. But Queen Kunti's praying, May all my love flow to you, just as the Ganges flows into the sea. 
so we could chant these different prayers. Um, but it's important to develop some internal um, cultivation. Cultivate, it's probably we call it the mental culture of Krishna consciousness. Consciousness to um, desire, pure devotional service, to de desire to awaken our love for Krishna. And sometimes devotees fall into the into the uh, into the habit of just running around, just running here, running there, doing this, doing that, which is all good. I mean, we're engaging our body in the devotional service of Krishna. That's good. Um, but Srila Prabhupada and our Acharyas, Nartam Das Thakur says in the Premi Bhakti Chandrika, which is a very beautiful book, he says that devotional service not only is done, it's not only um, performed with the body, but it has to be performed with the mind as well. And that means thinking of Krishna's name, form, quality, pastimes. It means um, actively praying to Krishna. Not that we're just, you know, moving our arms you know, offering incense or cooking or distributing books or typing on the computer, correspondence or this and that. We do that, <laughs> but we also have to, it's internal um, cultivation as well. So, yeah. Why is it so hard for us to um, cultivate um, uh, it's, uh I don't know what the word um, devotional service internally or cultivate bhakti internally is that because we are always um, uh, used to being active in, in material life we're always you know running around we always want to do something yeah. this is this is why uh, you can say uh, it's hard for us to focus on meditation yeah chanting yeah um, well I mean we just may not be used to it uh, you know, we didn't really grow up. Most people didn't grow up in a kind of sattvic, meditative atmosphere. Quite the opposite. So, but also, I mean, while we're running around <laughs> or while we're doing things which are necessary to do, we could use that as time to cultivate internally. Um, in other words, it's we may be busy externally, but we could be listening to some kirtan and, and then chanting along with kirtan, <coughs> listening. Or uh, we could, so many things like that. It's just, it's, in other words, it's, it's not just meant to be, like Rupa Goswami says, Atyahara Priyasas Chaprajalpa Niyamagraha. Niyamagraha means neglecting the rules and regulations or following them mechanically. Mechanically means that we're just, our body's moving and we're going through the actions, but we're, our mind is not focused enough. But ultimately, if you're running around all day and if you keep uh, Krishna in mind and, and you meditate in the pastimes, you know what, what you work for. You're working for Krishna, for his devotees. Then it's, yeah. a, it's a success. It's, yeah. it's Like Arjun, he was on the battlefield fighting, right? Shooting arrows. So that's fine. Um, but yeah, we just have to be careful that we're also cultivating. Because sometimes you see people <laughs> and they're just like, they're, they look like they're doing well. <laughs> they're doing everything they're supposed to do. Right? Hey, he's getting up in the morning, he's attending Mangalarti, he's cooking, he's distributing, he's preaching, and then all of a sudden he's just like, hey, where'd he go? <laughs> it's like gone. Like, like just like, and he leaves some note or something. Yeah, I've been festering all these types of desires inside me and I'm frustrated and angry and this and that and I'm just out of here and plunge me into the 
to the to the cesspool, the poison pool of sense gratification. Sign me up, right? I mean, even sometimes sw swamis. I mean, so it means something was not right. There was something not not right. Um, so we just have to be careful that okay, externally we have to be engaged. Yes. But we want to be careful that we're internally cultivating the right desires and we're the right mood. Like Prabhupada says that, Srila Prabhupada says in the Nectar of Instruction, I think it's the preface, he says that the attitude, the, 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 um, Krishna, the advancement of Krishna consciousness depends on the attitude of the follower. He says it doesn't depend on them living here, or living there, or living in this temple, or living in that temple, or wearing this type of clothes, or that type of clothes. I mean, it's this color clothes, that color clothes. Or it doesn't mean that... I mean, you could be getting up at 4 o'clock every morning, or earlier, and and doing impeccable deity worship, and means externally, on time, clean. You could be doing everything, and just not, ple not be pleasing to Krishna. <laughs> But if you do those things, rising early, attending Mangalarti, all these different if you do it in the right attitude, um, then you can please Krishna. So that's the key. Not just to do, do the activities, but to do them in the right attitude, with the right attitude. And that um, is, that's, our advancement depends on that. You see, sometimes people, they're doing the same thing. They're both rising early, they're both sending Mongol Arati, they're both, right? They're doing the exact same thing. And then over time, one person's making considerable progress, another person's not. May not be making as much progress. So why is that? Well, attitude. It's, there's some, we need to adjust the attitude and... Um, Speaking to myself here, I need to adjust my attitude. Um, so yeah. One last thing is, is Krishna and uh, I mean Prabhupada and the Prabhupada was saying that if you have material desires, you don't need to pray and ask uh, Krishna for it; it will be just fulfilled. And what about uh, desires for spiritual growth? It's known to Krishna, but we pray to to at attract uh, more uh, attention, or is it necessary to pray? Uh, well, it says that the queens in Dwarka and the spiritual world says they clean, even though it doesn't need to be cleaned, <laughs> because um, it's a spiritual world. Like, anyways, it's mentioned there in the Bhagavatam. It doesn't need to be cleaned. There's hardly any dust or dirt, but they still clean. So, um. From one perspective, you say, oh, well, we don't need to pray. Krishna already knows. But devotees like to pray. And there's so many prayers in the Bhagavatam, and we, we, we could pray, and we should pray. Uh, yeah. But we should be honest in our prayer. Like, Bhakti Sundar Goswami was mentioned the other day in a, in a, at, at Sangeeta Mataji's house. About okay, we could say, please free me from all material desires, but we may. may what if we don't want that <laughs> at this particular stage? So we're just praying, please free me. But it's like we know we don't want it. So you could say, please, Krishna, help me develop a desire to become free from material desires. It's, it's more honest. Whereas Saint Augustine, who had a colorful, you. you uh, colorful um, youth it means he was very sensual and attached to the material world in so many ways. And then he became Saint Augustine. But anyways, he said he was praying <laughs> for God to help him with his chastity, with his right. But he realized later that um, he didn't really want it as much as. He was thinking he did at the time. Um, so sometimes it's tough because it's like maybe somewhere 
internally we want. We want Krishna, right? But then there's all this other covering. So we're praying, oh, Krishna, please, you know, let me have you. Let me, let me, let me be connected to you. But how, much, how, how strong is that desire? How strong is that, uh, how, yeah, how strong is the desire to have Krishna? There's so many other desires. So, um, but if we somehow get to the point where we just want Krishna alone, then, yeah, Krishna reciprocates according to our, how we approach him. So, um, in other words, sometimes we may not, we may be praying for something, but maybe we don't desire, we're not desiring enough. And therefore we're not, you can say, why isn't it happening, right? Why isn't it Krishna fulfilling this? Well, maybe we're, we're really not wanting it as much as we should. And why should Krishna fulfill something that we're not, it's like a weak desire. It's a weak prayer, weak desire. Why should Krishna reciprocate with weak prayer, weak desire? So um, we have to make our desire for him strong. And the prayer is strong and powerful. So, and then there's some chance, right? So, yeah, it could be a little, <laughs> could be a little discouraging, um, maybe, from a particular perspective. But, um, and could be seen as difficult. Uh, but that's what we're going for. We're going for a... It's a challenge. It's a challenging goal to attain, love for Krishna. And Krishna really wants to see us, see us give every ounce of energy that we have to attain it. Um, blood, sweat, tears. I was thinking about blood. I was thinking about how we, because of course it, you could say it's just a saying, oh, just give your blood, sweat, tears. I was thinking sometimes when you're out there hitting the Murdunga, <laughs> you get cracks and blood, blood. Yeah, cooking. Well, we gotta be careful. Christian doesn't. <laughs> um, yeah. So, but we have to do something. Uh, we have to do something intense. And drastic, like it was a drastic, is that the right word? Yeah, to in order to become free, free, free from material desires. Like in the Bible, it says, "Well, eyes give you a problem, just pluck them out." Right now, of course, that doesn't mean necessarily to pluck your eyeballs out. Um, it may mean that, but not necessarily. Don't try it. But. It means to do something intense to 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 make a drastic change in one's life um, in accordance or under the direction of the spiritual master and other Vaishnavas so that one could get free from material desire. That may be joining an ashram, that may be whatever, traveling Sankirtan, that may be Increasing the intensity of one's rounds, that way maybe increasing the intensity of one's endeavor. Um, not sitting back in a lazy boy. Of course, we don't have lazy boys here. You know, lazy boys, recliner, chair. I mean, we can't, we can't, no one can expect that they're going to get God's mercy just sitting back in a lazy boy recliner, you know, with the legs up and they got their prayer beads and <laughs> falling asleep and okay, pass me the lossy and right? It just doesn't happen like that. It just it, the 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 the, dra the the drastic change will not take place. That's necessary. It just won't take place. Um but there has to be some real endeavor. And then there's a chance. We're hoping against hope that 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 we can uh that the necessary changes can take place. 
Uh, so yeah, it's in many ways, in many ways, uh, depending on our good fortune and our ability to, right, turn up the heat, right, and our ability to put out more and more energy. So whether that's through our own endeavors, whether that's through the endeavors of ourselves and others, means the mercy of the devotees, but um, somehow or other, that's actually the value of associating with more advanced devotees is that they 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 push us in a good way. <laughs> they push us in a good way. Not not doesn't necessarily have to be by their words. It may be by their words, but just by their actions, just by seeing them, just by actually looking at them in the face. Just by seeing them, just by seeing their activities, just by, um, and also by communication with them, you just feel, okay, I have to, I have to try harder. That's the value of association with the spiritual master. That's the value of association with devotees. Yeah, different devotees. So, um, okay. This, Okay, Joseph's not here, so I have a comment, a question, and a comment slash question. All right. So the comment was, um, I forgot if it was just in your class or if it was when you were discussing Dimitri's question, but um, I only just, I didn't notice it until recently when we had the verse, like it was verse 9, so recently, um, but in the purport, Prabhupada's saying how um, anyone who offers a prayer asks for something. And, of course, in this verse in purport, it's saying that, um, well, even a devotee may ask for something, but it's not good. You know, it's acceptable, better than, you know, something else, better than, you know, asking a demigod or something, but not ideal. Um, but then in that purport, he was saying that um, even uh, not only may a devotee, you know, because there's four kinds of devotees, but he says um, even a pure devotee will always ask for something in his prayer. Um, he'll ask for benedictions. So it's just a matter of what the benediction is, and then it goes into, so, Shapalad, you know, asking, you know, benediction, uh, selfless benediction. And then, and relating it to the Chikshastakam verse, you know, I, uh, he's asking a benediction, Mahaprabhu is asking the benediction that I become a servant at, at your lotus feet. So the prayer is always asking for something. Yeah. But um, that was just the comment. I was thinking that. Then the comment slash question was, um, when Bhakti Sundar Maharaj was here uh, two days ago, um, Michelle asked about, well, um, is it, you aren't supposed to approach, you know, Krishna and pray for something material, but what if you're praying for, you know, a good husband as a devotee, something like that? And um, so that's still not so clear to me. I mean, when, when, when Maharaj replied, he said that, well, he mentioned the CC pastime where Mahaprabhu, you know, took the offerings, insisted that they gave the offerings to him that were meant yeah. for, you know, the sacrifice to get a good husband. And um, and so in the Purva Prabhupada says that okay you can worship Mahaprabhu for a good husband a good de devotee husband Vaishnava husband, and but then Bhakti Sundar Maharaj specifically said that's acceptable. Now in this verse and another or purport and in other places you know when he's saying well that's an acceptable prayer it's an also an acceptable prayer to see Krishna for wealth or something it's acceptable in relation as opposed to seeking wealth somewhere else just like here it's saying you know yeah. in the Bhagavad Gita verse. So in that case now maybe we don't want to try to like interpret Bhakti Sundar Maharaj but maybe I mean, you could say more on it because in this case it's still not clear to me because it's saying that a prayer for your own benefit is unnecessary because Krishna will take care of your benefit now praying for like a materially good husband is for my benefit but is praying for a spiritually good husband is also for my benefit so is either um, appropriate or is neither necessary should I should you know yeah what, what would you say about that um well, I mean, a, a person, we see that devotees, they do ask. I mean, you have like, uh, you have a Devahuti and um, Kardama Muni, right? And he was wanting a wife. And as far as I remember in the Bhagavatam, he's, he's asking for a wife and then you have like Sudama Brahman of course his wife asked him to go ask Krishna for some help because we're poor and this and that and see what Krishna could do 
So there are some, there are cases like that. Um, and you could say that, well, what's the use? I mean, we, uh, what's, what's the use of asking if Krishna already knows or if Krishna already, right? He's, he's already going to provide. What's the use? Why ask? And one thing, one thing that we could think of is uh, it may be seen as a uh, aspect of rasa or as a relationship. Like, for example, um, you may know the answer to a particular uh, question you have, or you may have an idea of it, more or less, or you may be completely satisfied with the answer you have in relation to a particular question. But some sadhu comes and you may ask <laughs> just for the purpose of hearing him and his realization and, and so as a, like a rasa, the relationship. So uh, you could say Sudama Brahman, if he really needed and really wanted some help, he could have just kind of he could have just depended on Krishna, not went and asked him. And then the arrangements could have happened, right? He would have, could have got what he needed. But he used it as an opportunity. Okay, let me go see Krishna. Let me serve Krishna. Let me get Krishna's association. Same with, uh, like the cowherd boys, when there's a forest fire, they could have just seen the forest fire and just, they knew, they, they, they had an idea. Of course, it's a yoga maya going on and everything, but they called out to Krishna. You could say they had so much faith that Krishna would have just came and saved them, but they, uh, they called out to Krishna specifically for help. Um, so, um, so yeah, there's an aspect of like rest or that relationship there, like ha wanting to have a, you know, loving relationship with Krishna. Um, yeah, that's one thing. My last, my last, or my question, uh, last thing is, um, it was, this is quite confusing to me, how, um, Prabhupada says in the purport, well, he's saying, Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur says, that, yeah. Even if a devotee wishes the Lord fulfills a desire, he shouldn't be considered a Sakama devotee. Yeah. So in that case, there isn't such thing as a Sakama devotee or a Sakama <laughs> bhakta. So I, because we say the demigods are Sakama bhaktas because they serve Krishna, they follow his instructions, but it's because they want something, they want to enjoy or something. Yeah. But it seems that then they would follow. They would also fall into that category, that Bhagavad Gita verse seven, whatever it was, um, seven sixteen. Well, specifically this particular statement right here. Mm -hmm. About Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur explains that even a devotee wishes the Lord to fulfill a particular desire, the devotee should not be considered a Sakama Bhakta, mm. a devotee with some motive. Specifically, this is being, um, as far as I understand, because I've heard this been brought up okay. before, mm. that it's referring to this particular pastime. That's why I brought it up about the cowherd boys crying out to mm. Krishna with a forest fire. Because okay. you could say, why would they be doing that? Like, what are they scared? Or like, they want Krishna to come save them? Isn't that kind of selfish, right? So he's saying in this particular pastime about the forest fire, he said you shouldn't consider them Sakama devotees just because they're, they're asking Krishna for something. Um, because ultimately that asking Krishna for something is actually for Krishna's pleasure. Just like, please save us. Okay, it's out of rasa, it's out of relationship. But ultimately, you're thinking about Krishna's pleasure. And if we all perish in the forest fire, where's our relationship with Krishna? We want to be there for Krishna. Just like Srimati Radharani, when Krishna left to Mathura and then Dwarka, she was feeling a lot of separate, I mean, inconceivable separation. And she was thinking, oh, better I just give up my life. But then she's thinking, I can't give up my life because... Krishna comes back, that won't be very good. So I can't do that. So, um, yeah. So there's an aspect there of they're doing things for Krishna 
pleasure. And even even though they may ask for something, it's still ultimately for Krishna's pleasure. Just like Sudama Brahman, okay, he got all that material opulence, but what did he do with it? He didn't just become like a sans enjoyer in the material world. He used everything in Krishna's service. And that's why Krishna gave it to him. So, yeah. Um, but in terms, I mean, there, there are some statements within this purport which, which one could conclude that, oh, there's no, succum there's no succumb of devotees. I mean, another way of looking at it is that, like Srila Prabhupada said, how many pure devotees are in ISKCON? Right? There's 50 devotees at the time. Oh, Prabhupada said, okay, there's 50 devotees and pure devotees in ISKCON. Now, what does that mean? It means, okay, were they all like absolutely pure? It means by desire, by over time. You know, you get a green, unripe, hard mango, and then over time it ripens, right? So, in one sense, okay, there's no Sakama devotees because just give a little time. <laughs> but in another sense, there are Sakama devotees. There is a difference between a ripe mango and an unripe mango. Prophet actually even also said this the same thing. He said that over time it'll vanquish. It'll vanquish. Yeah. So same thing he said. Yeah. So over time. So yeah. All right. No pending questions. Yes, there's a pending question. <laughs> May I? Yes. Uh, Prabhu, Dandavat uh, Pranam, Balaram Prabhu. Based on not worshiping Krishna with material motivation. My question is, can you mention at least one of the symptoms of pure chanting? One of the symptoms of pure chanting? Yes. Um, this, one of the symptoms of pure chanting, well... Tears streaming from, from my eyes, my voice... <laughs> yeah, tears, tears flowing from... Well... Uh, one symptom of, of pure chanting is, yeah, these ecstatic emotions or feelings uh, will, um, will manifest in our consciousness. So that's definitely a, 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 a symptomatic, right? If we're purely chanting, then, yeah, we will feel these ecstatic emotions for Krishna. We will feel love for Krishna. Um, whereas if we're not... Yeah, chanting purely, then we don't feel that. We feel other things. Um, we may have glimpses sometimes of higher stages of chanting, pure chanting, and we may therefore feel some, could say, or experience some glimpses or some shadows of love for Krishna. But the main thing is that when a person's purely chanting, that they will feel this. Uh, they'll be very absorbed in Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. So, it's actually, it's like night and day, actually. <laughs> attentive chanting and inattentive chanting. So, all right. I think Mukunda Charna probably had something. Well, I was thinking you could also probably add to that, because, like, in between, like, my chanting and, like, pure devotee chanting, you could say, like, seeing that it's becoming more pure, you could just say, okay, how many offenses are going on, right? Like, of the ten offenses, how many are going on right now, you know? So like how inattentive, so it seems like it's coming closer to pure chanting at least. At least it's moving up there. If yeah. It's less, and it's more attentive, it's less. This yeah, there's, there's, there's offensive chanting, right? Then there's the clearing stage, which Sri the Prophet said, we're trying to avoid the ten offenses, which is important. And then there's the pure stage. So we want to reach the pure stage. I hope that satisfies uh, you. Uh, yes, and Prabhu, if I may, it reminded me of uh, the pure chanting of Haridas Thakur converting the the prostitute. Yeah, yeah. Uh, pure <laughs> chanting. One of the symptoms of, of pure chanting is also to be being capable of converting sure. sinful people to pure devotion. Yes, yes. That's thank you. Oh, you're welcome, Prabhu. Wonderful class. Thank you very much, Hare Krishna. Okay, Hare Krishna. Thank you. Well, yeah, you could say, like, well, is my chanting pure? I gotta go find a prostitute.